Hello, so today we're going to be looking at the lower cross syndrome. So last presentation we looked at upper cross, our rounding of the shoulders chin poke. Now we're going to look at the lower body equivalent. So in this case, the lower cross, rather than our rounding forwards, we're looking at the pelvis and the way the pelvis is tilting. So in a nice neutral spine position, you have a gentle curve in the lower back with an anterior tilted pelvis, as we see in a lower cross syndrome position, the pelvis tilts forwards, creating this lordotic lumbar arch. This is really, really common in lots of people that have lower back issues. So I'm going to talk about what might be causing that postural issue, what muscles again are going to be tight or weak and what we can do as therapists to try and correct it. So first, what causes this? Well, quite often it can be to do with the, the fact that people are, again, office workers, sedentary, sat down all day. Various muscles that will be discussed in a moment become weak and tight and the pelvis is then pulled into that anterior tilt. It could be to do with um, what people tend to wear. I quite often find that women that wear high heeled shoes, or men, um, that an anterior tilt occurs because the pelvis is being rotated into that position by people being up on their toes the whole time. Weight plays uh, a massive factor in the, the location of people's body mass. So if people have got a lot of anterior weight, again that big stomach pulling everything forwards, creating that tilt in the lower back. Again we'll see it um, with weight distribution in uh, pregnant women, again a big front load pulling everything forwards, creating an arch in the back. So what muscles then are involved? So if we look at our cross, again we've got our weak and our tight muscles. So weak, weak, tight, tight. In this case we're looking at either side of that, that pelvis. So at the top of the pelvis, at the front, we've got the abdominals. Now if you think people sat down all day, they're not using those abdominals to control their movement, these become very weak. In particular transverse abdominus, which is a deep lying abdominal muscle that helps compress the stomach in and control that, that pelvic tilt. So transverse abdominus is always weak in people with that lordotic spine. Then if we look at the other side, at our tight muscles, so if we've got abdominals at the front, then we've got the spinal erectors at the back, erector spinae they become very short and tight. And you'll find that with your massaging, that when you try and massage out those lower backs of those people in a lordotic posture, they'll be very... You'll feel this tension there running up the spine. So we've got our tight erectors. If we move down, so we think of our bucket-shaped pelvis, if we move down the other side of the bucket, the underside, we've got weakness at the back, because those muscles aren't pulling that pelvis down into position, so weakness at the back in the glutes and the hamstrings. We're going to talk a little bit more about hamstrings in a little bit, but definitely glutes are weak. And then at the front, because this is weak at the back, this has to be tight at the front. So it's tightness through those hip flexors, iliopsoas, and quite often TFL, tensor fascia latae as well and also big muscle that crosses both knee and hip, rectus femoris, rec fem, that's also tight. So hamstrings are, are, are a curiosity because quite often they appear like they're quite tight in a lot of people because people always stretch and they feel, they feel like they're tight. But because of that anterior tilt, those hamstrings are being pulled. They're being pulled taut. So they feel tight, but they're not. They're on a stretch. So it doesn't help to keep stretching them if, if you think about it, this at the back 
is weak, you need to strengthen them. These at the front are tight, stretch hip flexors, stretch rec fem, stretch quads. So those are the muscles at play here. So what are we going to do to try and treat them? So if we think again, if it's tight, lengthen, if it's weak, strengthen. So hamstrings, glutes, strengthen the glutes, strengthen the hamstrings. Think of our exercises like our Romanian deadlifts, our squats, our leg presses, anything that gets into those glutes, shoulder bridges, anything that can, can make those do some work. Core exercises, there are plenty, but think about deep core rather than just thinking about abs and sit-ups. So let's think about our, um, our transverse abdominus engagement, that pulling of the belly button in, bracing effect, and then producing movement. So things like toe taps lying on your back, bracing in, tapping the toes down, even straight leg raises, if people can maintain that neutral spine position. And then what about those tight ones? So our massage techniques, brilliant on quads. So lots of lovely deep work can be done on quads, massage, foam rolling, stretching them out, these things. And erector spinae. Lots can be done with, with that lower back. And don't just think about your cat stretch, which is very good, cat, child's pose. Think about rotation as well, stretching it out in different movements. I find with a lot of people with lower back issues, the problem is a lack of movement, being stuck in a stiff position. The more you can get them moving, the more you can open them up, and the happier and more comfortable they'll be. So, we've had a look at our cross. We know the muscles involved. We know what it looks like, that lordotic curving of the spine. What are the long-term consequences? Other than obviously um, non-specific lower back pain is a big one with, with this lower cross. People just feel like they've got an achy, stiff back, a dull ache, that muscle ache. Uh, but also it can lead to other issues. Again, a bit like with our shoulder impingement, we can get hip impingement. If the pelvis is anteriorly tilted, there's less room for that ball and socket to work and you get other complications. So you might get a hip impingement pain from having this lower cross syndrome. Also, because there's less room to move, people perform compensatory movements. Things like... Um, Things like um, they, they tend to kind of adjust their thigh position so then the femur starts to rotate inwards, which means there's less space in that joint. Um, and then they start to uh, compensate in their squat pattern with things like turning the feet out, that duck foot position, which then can have an impact on knees. So quite often you might see that someone who's got that lordotic posture also tends to fall into knee valgus in a lot of their movements and then that can lead to knee injuries and other issues so we again we've got to think of our kinetic chain so if we've got a lower cross situation what are they doing elsewhere can they still squat um, in a linear position or are they falling into knee valgus have they got good ankle mobility as well because it could be that because of that valgus position that they're compromising through their ankles as well. So always have a think about not only the back and the back pain itself, but what else could this be, um, what else could be going on here. And now we're going to have a little look at our link between our upper and our lower cross. If we think about that lordotic position, so someone falling into this this arching of the back, what quite often happens is they bring the head forwards to compensate. So you might actually get a combination of kyphosis and lordosis, so both upper and lower. And you think about that rounding of the shoulders, because we're naturally predators, we want to be up here. So what happens to get us back up into there is we start lifting the chest and extending through the back. So one 
can lead to the other. So you might have people that have got both upper and lower cross and you just need to treat them both accordingly. Thank you for listening.